What Drives You is brought to you by Ziggler, your premier source for equipping life and leadership coaches. Visit Ziggler.com and let them inspire your true coaching performance. Yeah. Welcome to What Drives You. I'm Kevin Miller, and I'm here to help you get clarity on what drives you and why, so you can upshift your life to go further and faster, but with more peace and ease. We are driven people who want to reach great destinations and achievements, but enjoy the daily drive so much that we don't want to ever stop driving, and every day feels like a success. In this episode, I am back with Thomas Curran in our series on perfectionism and how we don't understand what it actually says about us and how it's sabotage, sabotaging our drive. And we want to get out of this performance or perfection trap, performance as well, but perfection trap. And this is part two in the series, and it's my What Drives You episode. As you know, I do with every personality we have on the show. We're going to go behind the scenes and hear what drives our expert on perfection in the key areas of his life. Thomas, again, he's got a PhD in psychology. He's a professor in the Department of Psychological and Behavioral Science at the London School of Economics, where he studies the personality characteristics of perfectionism, how it develops, how it impacts our mental health. I encourage you to check out his TED Talk on our dangerous obsession with perfectionism. It has more than 3 million views. Uh, Thomas's new book, and again, our muse for the series, is The Perfection Trap, Embracing the Power of Good Enough, uh, which you can get on Amazon or wherever you get your books. Well, Thomas, it's great to be back with you here. I got to admit, I'm interested to hear how you deal with perfectionism and your own issues around that in these key areas of life. Thanks for being back with us. Thank you. It's great to be back. Well, let's start off with spirituality and what drives you in your spirituality, what your values are, what you do to walk it out. And I want to I recall in our first talk together, you talked about, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit, but an, an, an antidote somewhat to perfectionism uh, is having a concept of something greater than yourself. You said it in those words, but I'll let you I'll let you rephrase that correctly for me. Yeah, it's really important. I mean, I've spent most of my life doing completely the opposite, which is to try to people please and and strive to achieve things for the outcome, right? Overvaluing the outcome, the destination, mm -hmm. undervaluing myself. I mean, if you want to put it in mm -hmm. simple terms. And writing the book actually is quite a clarifying moment because it made me reflect a lot on my past, my upbringing, and people in my life that I uh, that were reported to me. And one of the people was my grandfather. My grandfather was a master craftsman. He was a carpenter. And he made everyday things like banisters, chairs, tabletops, bar tops, um, uh, staircases, all sorts of everyday things. Um and from the vantage point of a child, it was kind of magical just to watch him work. And, and these are reflections I was making because I was thinking, you know, his job and my job are so different. And we strive in so, such different ways. He he was motivated to leave things in the world for other people to use. That was his main objective. You know, he would go to his uh, job. He would install the staircases, tabletops and all the rest of it, window frames. And then he'd just go home. He wouldn't loiter for applause. He wouldn't wait for a five-star review or a fire emoji on <laughs> Instagram, whatever it is we do these days. He just went home. And and knowing that the pride was the pride was the job itself. <laughs> uh, it was and I had you know, talking to my father as well, he he would say, you know, well, he wasn't perfect, you know, he made mistakes, but he just let those mistakes wash through him. A sure sign of his fallibility is his wrinkles or his sciatica. You know, these are just part and parcel of life. And that reflecting on that was was kind of an epiphany for me because that's a completely different way to work, but one that has so much magic, you know, so much joy in just knowing that you're leaving things in this world for other people to use, to enjoy, to be inspired by. And that really should always be the uh, motivation. By the way, his his um, carpentry is still in the pubs and bars of Northamptonshire, where I come from today. And my and my father will go in there often and have a drink. And it, it just almost it's almost like he's there with us, right? Uh, because they've stood the test of time, and that's testament to his high standards. But it's not testament to his perfectionism. And that's I think crucial. 
something that I think is so, so important that guy that I try now to make sure guides me at all times is that what I'm doing with writing this book, teaching students is not about me, uh, but is about the vocation about why I'm doing it and why it's important that I'm able to write these things and communicate these messages so that I can bring people hopefully to a better awareness about perfectionism and convince people that it's not perhaps the secret to success that we think it is. So that's my vocation. I try to cling on to as much as I can. Well, it's interesting as you say that because from, uh, I mean, the foundation of spirituality, I, I define it as it is the devotion to something greater than yourself. And you have taken this aspect of perfectionism. You teach on it. You're writing on it now. You've been studying it. You've devoted so much of yourself to it yeah. to help people, to help others, to help yourself, but to help others have a more joyful existence, which is by proxy. Yeah, it's it, 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 that is something greater than self. That is a core foundation of spirituality and, and it's interesting that I, I appreciate you bringing that up vocation that he did it your grandfather did it for the vocation it wasn't a depiction of his self-worth which is so much what we do today and i don't know what crossed the line what what what, what brought us out of that to where we are today that's a big question i could t i can tell you one big thing Let's take us. Right? We're, we're 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 writers, and um, I'm an academic, but uh, you're you're a cr creative, and you produce a podcast, and you coach, and, and and all the rest of it. But essentially, we also have a, a shared interest in us writing, and we both written books. Now, if we'd been authors 30, 40 years ago, we might get the we might get a review from the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal. We might, but beyond that. We're not told in instantly what you think because there's no Goodreads. There's no Amazon ratings in those days. You just put a book into the world and that was your work. And if people liked it or didn't like it, that was up to them. They couldn't really let you know unless they're in your immediate orbit. Yeah. So, so, so the world today is, you know, if my grandfather was around today, I'm sure he would have had a little bit of perfectionism because how can you not? Like as soon as he did the work, somebody's online giving him a review. Was it a five-star piece of work or did he leave a bit of varnish or, you know, was there a screw chip jutting imperceptibly? Cause that's a couple of stars off, right? Same for a book, you know, you put it out into the world and within five minutes, somebody's on Goodreads telling you what they think, right? Could be good, could be bad, could be indifferent, but you're told all the time, how can you not then become a little bit dependent on what other people are thinking in terms of how valuable you think your work is? It's that's the way the whole of modern society is structured to teach us that every time you put something into the world, what matters is what other people's approval, uh, validation and praise is yes. for it. And and so, yes, you know, this is certainly something that we have to fight against. It feels like all the time talking about a vocation, it says, oh, it sounds amazing, but actually doing it is so, so tough because, you know, as uh, like, like, you know, like I know you put something out into the world, you, you put all of yourself into it. It's really dispiriting when somebody doesn't really like it. It can feel quite personal and 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 in some ways it's supposed to be <laughs> so i think we we have to realize that again this is a this is very much a cultural shift these are changes that are occurring in our broader environment that are teaching us it's really important that we do focus on validation approval and the outcomes rather than the vocation itself but even more so important in that context for us to recognize that there is something bigger than us it's it's so interesting, Thomas. Your statement on that. Thinking back to your grandfather, you've got me thinking. So you know, here's a pub, and it needs some stairs. There's a first floor and a second floor. He comes in. I don't know how to do it. A lot of people don't know how to do it. He knows how to take a piece of wood to notch it to you know put some cross beams, how to put it together, and boom, he puts the stairs in, and you come in, and you can walk from the first floor to the second floor. Great set of stairs. I'm happy. And today, we just don't do that. Yeah, you, you got me thinking, especially when we talk about the reviews, everything's built on perception. We are we are doing everything vocationally. Well, I should say we, we, we are in an unhealthy way for perception. It's not whether you did stairs. It's how somebody perceives them. And if they perceive them poorly, critically in any way, they, they come back and the judgment 
gosh, really the judge, I mean, it's a judgment on you, on who you yeah. are as an individual yeah. on your self worth. Yeah. If I don't like your book. Well, it's, it's a pox on you, right? Yeah. It's, it's not that, uh, you know what? It's not, it, the book is not Thomas. Yeah. But that's how we take our vocations, isn't it? But this is also one of the reasons why I think it's really important we, we recognize that these are very like normal feelings. So often in CBT, there's a tendency, oh, we've got to reframe because that's an irrational thought. But what I'm trying to also say in the book is at some level, it is kind of rational to feel like this is going to be what happens when I put something out there because it is actually what will happen. What's really important to reframe is not the act or the fact that people are going to judge but it's actually the consequences of that judgment because often we can catastrophize the consequences of critical judgment yeah. not that we're so, so one of the tendencies to go well you know reframe that you're going to get critical judgment because you might not well actually you probably will particularly if it's a big thing like if you're doing something big you're putting it out into the world it's not always going to be positive I, I can tell you that from first hand experience but what is quite interesting is that the impact of the critical feedback is nowhere near as bad as you make it out to be. And that's what I think we need to soften in our minds. That actually, we are going to encounter critical feedback. It's just the world we live in. But instead of that holding us back from putting things into the world, we can't possibly put it in because somebody's going to say something bad, that actually we just feel that fear, put it in there anyway. And that's like taking a sledgehammer to the perfectionism because you are going to get a bit of critical feedback. Somebody out there is not going to like it. But whatever like okay it's like it's nowhere near as bad as you build it up in your mind to be uh and you can just get on with it like and so it's so on the one hand it's really important we recognize these things but on the other hand it's so important we recognize them but still do it anyway and that's mm -hmm. i think the, the biggest way that we can overcome our perfection is being brave being courageous showing up right as we were talking in the last episode and just doing it just getting it done it's so funny, Thomas, as you say that and talking about our books, because I keep waiting for the one star review on Amazon that just says, this is the most elementary stuff I have ever read in my life. <laughs> Cause I kind of think, I think that about all books to some degree. I mean, there's, you know, there's, there's, there's nothing new under the sun said Solomon in 500 BC and there's nothing new. It, it's, it's a different day, a different age, a different challenge, whatever. But I don't know that there's any great secrets or wisdom that hasn't been you know, said. And so I'm kind of feeling like hey, it is, I think it's needed, but it's pretty elementary. Somebody's going to call me out on it. And, and I really think that as well. So, uh, well, here's to us. We should share our one-star reviews with each other. Uh, oh, you should see some of mine, Kevin, let me tell you. <laughs> well, I, I love that, that line. I wrote it down. Catast catastrophize the consequences of the judgment. And that's, that's huge in the aspect of perfectionism. And I, and I didn't hit that in the first uh, episode, but that was a key piece that came out as I read your book is just the aspect that there's so much of my own issues around perfectionism that are judgment, judgment from myself and the uh, possibility of judgment from others. And, and to what you just said a minute ago, it's, it should be, an, it's kind of an expectation. There is going to be some negative judgment there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the thing is, as perfectionists, we want to do everything we can to make sure that doesn't happen. Yeah. So we over, we overthink it. We think the most fail-safe method of making sure that everybody likes me and that nobody says anything bad is if I'm perfect. Because if I'm perfect, what can be criticized? But that's the that's what blocks the progress. It's that mm -hmm. fear that stops us moving forward. Because then we're not going to send anything out into the world until it's bulletproof, and nothing can ever be bulletproof. <laughs> So we differ, we iterate, we withhold, we don't let go. And that's what's the biggest impediment to success for the perfectionist is just mm -hmm. the blocking impact of the worry and the catastrophization of other people's judgment. And and I and I think it's so, so important that people hear the message that that is holding you back way more than it's pushing yeah. you forward. And that if we can just accept, a bit of radical acceptance maybe, yeah. that we're going to put things out into the world that's imperfect somebody's going to pick up on that and tell us it's imperfect but actually if we can sit with that for a little bit and we can know that that's going to happen and that when it does happen it's not going to be anywhere near as catastrophic as what we built it up to be then that can give us the courage to go ahead and send it into the world 
anyway. And it doesn't that you know, I'm, we're talking about writing books and so it doesn't have to be writing books. It can be setting off a project. It can be doing a pitch. It can be putting up a hand and giving a pitch. You know, the only way we're going to learn how to public speak and give pitches is to put a hand up and do it. If we if we feel that we're so um, insecure about it that we're going to hold ourselves back because we think we're not going to get the deal or whatever. That's not the way to think. Maybe we won't get the deal. Maybe on that occasion, the pitch wasn't very good and we, we didn't get the contract. But you know what? Like the very act of doing it and not having the outcome we wanted is such a big learning experience that helps us the next time that, so that when we do give the pitch, hopefully it's better and maybe we will win the contract. So, you know, it goes back to what I was saying in the last episode, progress over perfection every single time. You reminded me, we've been talking about cycling that I had a coach one time and the beginning of the year, we all got our brand new fancy bikes and he pulled out a key and he says, all right, everybody take this key and go scratch your bike. Like what? He said, yeah, just get it over with. Cause otherwise you're going to be baby in the thing. I need you to go out and race that thing and not worry about messing up your bike. I thought that is so smart. So it makes me think, you know, the next book we write, we should go give each other the first one star review. Just get it over with, you know, <laughs> written plastic. You, you made me, yeah. <laughs> but you made me um you made me think of a very funny story because uh, i used to race myself like not at the level you did but um and uh i totaled a bike and it was a i didn't have a lot of money and it was a really expensive bike and that's a problem when you do these races that that is a risk that can happen if you get involved in crap um and so my, my partner at the time didn't let me ride again because I just spent a fortune on this bike and bought it back in total. Uh, so that the reason I didn't do that was not because I didn't enjoy it or different like that, because I couldn't afford it. <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> fair enough. I, I can relate, relate to that er, early on. Thankful, Thankfully, later on, you wreck the bike and you get another one. That was a great, that was a great gift uh, back then. At that, <laughs> well, You talked about, you, you were already talking about vocation. Let's go into that. Yeah. So that's, categories, our work, our career, uh, our vocation. So when you look at where you are now with all that said as well, tell me what is, uh, I mean, to some degree you said that helping other people, but yeah, what is, is that the top of this? What is driving Thomas in the work that you do today as right. a professor, as an author and in all your roles? I think I just want to make a difference now. And in, by the way, this comes from a place of security as well. So I mean, you have to bear that in mind too. Like I have a tenured position. Uh, it's very difficult to remove me. <laughs> uh, and so I can now say this, oh, you know, I'll just take your foot off the accelerator and strive for the purpose and the rest of it. Really important to recognize that because I think sometimes messages from people in very secure positions can be uh, uh, can be heard by people who are in very insecure positions. Uh, and, uh, uh, and so I think we have to bear that in mind. However, what I would say is this advice I would still give to my younger self when I was in an school position, bouncing around from job to job, trying to come up the ladder. And that's because in the, in the, with the benefit of hindsight, I can see that what I was doing um, was not healthy and that there were way, way better ways to strive. That would have got me to the, exactly the same place, but with so much less stress and anguish. And that's really focusing on the most important things about what matters, not focusing on the competition. So looking next door in the office at how many grants the person next to me has and how many publications there is next to me have and always competing, trying relentlessly to compete and lift myself above others. Not worrying about that at all, but worrying instead about what if you know what it is that I want to understand. What is that we need to know in the field? What are the big questions that are hanging over us that need to be answered? And it might mean that I... I have to, you know, spend two, three years marinating on these um, topics and problems because they're a little bit more complex and they require a little bit more deep thought. But the benefit of that is that it allows me to to inform and educate in a way that I wouldn't have been able to do if I'd just done a lab study that has a very minute contribution. So thinking big and focusing on the purpose is so important because what really matters is what is the impact of our research? What is the impact of our teaching? And are we actually um, providing insight and inspiring people along the way? That's the most important thing. So we can think of our careers at one level as you know a very, uh, very a rat race to the top where we'll do anything to jump over other people. Or we can think of them as, as I say, as a vocation where what we're really trying to do is ask big questions, change people's ways of thinking, um, 
and put research into the world that that helps inform and educate and that's that's what at this moment in time for me that's the most important thing so my whole focus now is not on publications not even on grants it's just on asking the right questions and trying to educate and inform young people that come through my classroom in ways that hopefully will help them in their future careers and position themselves um to to be a success in whatever they do i mean that's 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 now what guides me and i hope that i would be just as successful with that mindset than i have been perhaps a more perfectionistic mindset um certainly the data suggests i will um but I am finding that I'm becoming a lot more content that way. I'm enjoying my job a lot more and I'm having more time outside of my job with my family. Um, and my, uh, my young son, which is just incredible time, time that I wouldn't have had if I'd continually pushed myself well beyond comfort in the office. So yeah, I, I feel like I have more balance and I feel like I have more purpose and those things are, 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 are like taking a sledgehammer to perfection. So appreciate your perspective. And can I add on to that? What something you said in the first, our first talk together was just having just the desire to have joy. Am I enjoying the process? You said that. Am I, am I finding, uh, yeah, gratitude and joy in the day to day? Uh, obviously that's, that's a big part of what I see you doing too, is looking at not just the end goal, but as you talked about the process and the daily progress there. Yeah, exactly. Like I think we can have, I think we can have goals and, you know, I've certainly got ideas and places I want to go next to, to work, but I think it's really important also to give ourselves flexibility and permission to maybe move in a different direction. If the wind takes us there, <laughs> it yeah. can't be rigid. You know what I mean? Like it can't be, it has to be this because life's not like that and it's going to throw curveballs and there's going to be difficulties along the way and i think it's so important that yes we have aspirations yes we have goals but we also allow some flexibility well the next category thomas is relationships and you've admitted that you struggle continually with perfectionism and you said people pleasing specifically so i'm interested in what drives you relationally one and, and two how this pursuit of understanding perfectionism has changed mm -hmm. your relational values it's a really good question um i haven't been asked this question before but i i know that there's definitely been times where my perfectionism has been an impediment to building lasting relationships um and not only that but also the insecurity if you know being a young person in the modern economy, particularly in the academic sphere, means you have to move from place to place, from job to job, from region to region. You can't settle down. You can't put down roots. Uh, you can't get in relationships because you know you're going to be moving. So it's just pointless. Um, you know, it sounds fun, doesn't it? And and at first, like, you know, this is really exciting. I'm going to go to Australia. Or I'm going to go to North America. Or I'm going to move up and down the UK. And these are all things I've done. Uh, and it sounds really exciting, but actually, you know, after a while, it, it becomes difficult because it does impact on your relationships. And all this comes from perfectionism, right? Like I had such a huge drive that I was willing to do anything to get there. And that meant uproot myself. Well, we have to recognize there's consequences to that. And one of them is relationships. So I've had a really difficult uh, relationship with relationships um, as a function of my perfectionism and also as a function of, you know, the way the world is these days. Yeah. Um, and, and so it's only now where I've been in a relative period of stability for the last three years, um, you know, some stability in my life where, uh, I've actually began to settle down, set up roots, find community and build relationships. And I have to tell you, like, it's the thing I've been missing, you know, as, as well as, you know, breaking down on the, the perfectionism, I think what I didn't realize I was missing in all those years I was moving around was actually just stability you know? yeah. <laughs> and having a, having a community of people around me that I value and appreciate. Um, that's the other piece to this, by the way. And I, so I would say, yeah, absolutely. It's had, it, it can also have a massive impact on relationships. It's only when you, you build them up and you, you, you have some stability, you realize how important that is. That's, it's been one of the biggest consequences of my perfectionism and people pleasing and conflict averseness has been, yeah, just relationships is how I have sabotaged them and the, the opposite, the absolute opposite of what I wanted to do. 
of what I wanted for myself. And, and I, and I caused problems with that, well, ultimately that insecurity. And so yeah. well, that's why you're on the show. You're continuing to help me. So thank you. Uh, yeah. Tell me about health and wellness, Thomas, what is driving you in your personal pursuit of health and wellness? Oh gosh. Um, again, like it's important not to be too perfectionistic about it. I mean, we talked about cycling. Cycling is a big part of my life. Um, and I used to take it so seriously. I couldn't go out without a computer. Like it just, mm-hmm. that would be, I'd even, you know, if I'd, <laughs> if I didn't have my computer or is that a battery, I couldn't go for a ride. Mm-hmm. That's like, I mean, it's, it's ridiculous when I think about it, but that was the, that was, a I got it. I got it. So, so oh, I'm, I'm not wearing the wrong watch, but I'm usually wearing uh, a Garmin, and so and and I've been so uh, disappointed in myself when I'll find that I go out and I do some ride or some run, and I'm feeling great. I think, man, this is going to be a great time. And I yeah. look down, I didn't start the stupid thing, and I'm irate. Yeah. But it doesn't count, and I have to tell yeah. myself, no, I actually benefited from it. I just don't have a record, which you know, years oh ago, we, yeah, yeah, I'm really, yeah. Can relate. Okay. That's why I inserted. Okay, keep, keep going. I I interrupted, but I can relate too much. I just I remember distinctly one time I nailed a climb. I was in such good. I had such good legs, and I got to the top. I got to the next turn. I looked down, hadn't turned it on. Exactly what you said. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that ruined the whole ride. I mean, I mean, I'm saying it to myself now, and I'm like, this is ridiculous. But anyway, that's. That's how it used to be, right? And and now um, I have a young son, so I don't have much time to exercise, and I'd want to do much more, but it's really tough. Um, so so my physical health is not where it was. And of course, again, back in the day, that would have really, really got to me. But it, I'm learning to accept that sometimes in life things come along. <laughs> and it means you can't do everything that you want to do, and that's okay. Yeah. Uh, and there'll be a time when things settle down, you're sleeping through the night, and we've got more time back where I'll start to get on the bike again, and I'll do more exercise, and I'll do it for the fun and the joy and the meditative moments that it gives me, uh, and not necessarily because I need the Garmin to tell me how well I'm going up the hill. And if I did take the Garmin, it would not be good. So it's not not really a good idea anyway. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so so again, you know, I mean, we keep repeating themes a little bit, but it is so important that the joy is what drives it, and those meditative moments are what's driving it, and not the outcome, and not the performance, and not what you put on it. Health and well-being is really about enjoyment, and if you you know if you can't do as much as you could before, that's okay. Um, it's it's really it's really about accepting that sometimes life gets in the way a little bit, but you know, uh, it's that the most important thing is you have. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's funny. I, I held up my watch. I'm not wearing my Garmin because I had I'm coming off of an injury, and I finally just put the dumb thing away. And so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna put it away. My my stats are terrible right now, and and they're just gonna be disappointing. So I'm not even gonna do it. Tell me about uh, on just the nutritional side, uh, diet or anything that you adhere to specifically there. Uh, well, I am uh, I don't eat um, much meat, so I've gone. I've, to, I've, uh, the only thing I really do with my diet is try to um, keep things balanced and not eat a, a, a ton of meat. Um, I'm pretty much a hundred percent vegetarian, I'd say, although I don't like to be strict about it because you can never be <laughs> that strict about it. You don't want to be perfectionist, right? Yeah. Thanks. No, you don't want to be perfectionist about it, you know. And it's so, that's so important, like because sometimes it, you need the meat. I, I can go a little bit anemic sometimes if I haven't had. Uh, you know, for a long time. So you have to give yourself the the, <laughs> the room to say, I need a bit of iron in my diet right now because I'm feeling it a little bit. So again, not rigid about diet, but certainly I would say um, vegetarian for most of the time, which is, uh, I feel a lot better with. Um, I try not to eat uh, junk food or ultra processed food. It's a big, um, it's a big thing that I try to avoid, try to cook uh, meals with the family because that's such important so, you know food is not just uh nutritional but it's also uh social time too um so there's nothing i would say that i do in particular um but i do have a kind of rough vegetarian diet that uh, i don't try to be too strict about but i do, do try to adhere to it's interesting, Thomas. I was I went through a time early on in my it was actually after we got married we were vegan which was 
perfectionism. It was, it was like a religion is how I related to it later. It was so hard to do anything social and whatnot. And then we did vegetarianism, but it was, you know, pretty strict even there. And today my wife coined it for us, at least we're flexitarian, uh, where there you go. Like, That's me. Yeah. Okay. Not so rigid. Well, it does remind me, I mean, look at thinking about this aspect, this whole concept of perfectionism of, I mean, just to take, a, uh, an analogy, the 80, 20 rule. You know, I mean, 80% of the time I want to be spot on, on my diet, on my exercise, but a hundred percent is exhausting. As you said, that word rigid, and I don't want to be so rigid about, I mean, maybe morally, you know, or ethically, I want to be rigid, but other than that, to give myself grace, that's the word I think of. Is there a word that you use? You know, I was going to ask you actually in the first show, and, and now I think about it, I thought about it. If you... I don't know if it's a fair question, but in a sense, if you took perfectionism as you define it, this, this, you know, unhealthy aspect of perfectionism, is it fair to ask what would be the, is there an, what would be the opposite in essence of perfectionism? That's a really, it's a really good question. The, I mean, the opposite of perfectionism, I suppose, is um, good enoughism, <laughs> for want of a better phrase. It's about, rec- it's about, it's okay. about, yeah. It's about recognizing that there are there's times in our lives where uh, we just have to get things going, like uh, mm-hmm. whether, whether that be in our work, whether that be in our relationships, whether that be um, in our families or whatever whatever it is. Uh, there's times where we just have to recognize that trying to find the perfect solution is not going to work. We're going to be constantly searching for it. So it's really important that we recognize sometimes there are compromises to be made. And, and that it's it's important for us to let that into our psychology to give ourselves permission for things to not go quite to plan and things to be not quite perfect and for people to be not quite perfect and for events to be not quite perfect and and all of that is wrapped up in this sense of as, as I mentioned this sense of good enoughism is so we can recognize that the most important thing is is good enough like and yeah. that's then that that allows us to do all sorts of things that perfectionism doesn't allow us to do allows us to recognize that in this moment it's okay i'm happy my family's healthy and all the rest of it this is this is a good enough outcome why do i need more than this it's <laughs> and it allows us to savor those moments and enjoy them mm. um and it also gives us permission uh, when things don't go well to reflect on those in compassionate ways to know that that's just life yeah. and sometimes things go wrong and things are come outside of our control that we that we didn't see coming but at the end of the day it's here now and we can radically accept that those things are going to have an impact on the amount of exercise we do or the quality of our diet or our health or our happiness at least for a little while and again uh, that permission is so psychologically liberating because the perfectionist mindset would not allow those things in it would push us past those things it would try to control them try to change them when there is nothing we can do uh, so I suppose the opposite, as I say, is very, uh, it's not the most scientific phrase, but nevertheless, I suppose it's the one that I think best fits this opposite perfection. Well, it reminds me of what you say in the book and you mentioned it in our first talk that in the perfectionist aspect of never, it never being enough, that's it. I mean, that it's never enough that you said, uh, it makes success, uh, a dead end. Every success is a dead end. Is that, that, did I get that right? Yeah. 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 That well, we have these, it steals we have these dreams. the joy. Yeah. Well, we have these dreams in our minds, don't we, of where we want to go. And let's say we make it and suddenly we just feel empty. And we're not really sure why, but we don't feel like it was a success that we thought it was or it should have been when we set out on the journey. Like PhD is a classic one, you know. When I was an undergraduate, the idea that I would get a PhD it was mesmerizing. But then they actually dotted the last I and crossed the last T, handed it in. And it was like, oh, <laughs> it was underwhelming because of, you know, this idea that we just simply can't take a step back and recognize the amazing achievement that we've just made in that moment. Because I suppose that final act was so small. So why should we be celebrating a cross T? Well, the reason why is because there's a bigger picture to this achievement. And it's not just the last cross T, it's the slog and the effort and the application that we've made to get to this point. And I think it's really important that we are able to reflect and recognize those achievements and enjoy them because uh, perfectionism will steal that joy for sure.
if we let it take over and focus on the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. It's so the, your message is so confirming, Thomas. I mean, it's it's com- or conf- it's comforting. Honestly, it's comforting. Like like taking a deep, deep breath, I can let go of that. I uh, up here in Colorado, I built it. We built a house about fifteen years ago. It was mm-hmm. just at that time, it was dream property, and we created our own house. And it's 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 really good. It's really yeah. good. It's not perfect. It's not perfect. And I, you know, now you look at the house and see what's not done or what I would have done differently. And I think about, I'll go someplace else and travel and think, oh, what a spot here. And I, I start to kind of get this anxiety of, okay, I need to do something more. We need a different house. We need a different view. We need a different one. And it was so tiring and it was so lacking in gratitude. And like you said, it, I'm not savoring it. And it was probably two years ago. But I'm, I'm bringing it up because I thought about it yesterday. I was out on a out on a walk and a run yesterday on this on the road up on our ridge and looking out and I thought this is just stupidly beautiful. Yeah. And and I thought it was a couple of years ago where I finally realized you know maybe we'll be led somewhere else and move someday. But if we don't, what if yeah. I die here? This is a pretty great place to go. It's an awesome place to live. It's a, and I had to come to that. Yeah. Kind of that good enough is this is, this is good enough. Why do I have to have better? It doesn't mean that I can't, but, but again, kind of back to your message of it, it doesn't, it's, it's not that you stop progressing or stop going after goals or achievement or whatever, but it's just the gratitude in the now. And can I be yeah. okay? now? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, you know, because if we take, if, if you follow that that mindset to its logical conclusion, you will begin to see how you never get there. Because as soon as you say, right. okay, well, we'll just, we'll move somewhere else. We'll do something more. And then we'll look around the corner and there'll be something more. And there'll be, and, and I suppose the question we have to ask ourselves is where does it end? And yes, that nothing is perfect. We don't live in a perfect world. Nobody's perfect could ever be made perfect. There are every individual is unique, just as every destination is unique. It has its own charms. It also all, it has its own drawbacks, but that's, right, that's right. what makes life life. That's what makes the planet so wonderfully and incomprehensibly beautiful is imperfections. And the fact that you have, you know, incredible scenery and also some spots that aren't so incredible. And that's just, that's just part and parcel of life. And it, I suppose it's about re- reconnecting with the reality that is an imperfect world and imperfect people. And if we can, and if we can accept that, then we can we we find much more space in our lives for good enough. Hmm. Next one is mind, the mind, your mental state, your mental health. Uh, in essence, tell me as you look at that, what uh, what's driving you? What are your values? What are you what are you going towards? My my mind, my values. At the moment, is it's like custard because I haven't slept. Um, <laughs> And, and I'm wondering whether that will ever come back. I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> please yeah, re- yeah. please reassure me, Kevin. <laughs> yeah, it does. At some point, they actually sleep through the night. It does happen. And and uh, right now, you can't remember. It's like being injured. You know, you can't remember <laughs> what it feels like to move without pain. So I feel you on that with the young. <laughs> yeah, and I, I I keep forgetting like. I, 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 you know, words or like phrases so that I would just instantly record. I'm, I'm struggling, like, but it, no, it's just lack of sleep. But this is like, again, uh, it, this would be a big challenge to me a few years ago as a professor trying to answer questions on the spot. You need to think very quickly. I'm not thinking very quickly right now. <laughs> Quite the opposite. I mean, no, no, that's okay. Fast. It, comes across, it comes across as very thoughtful. So just go with it. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, never mind thinking fast and slow. I'm just thinking slow at the moment. But having said that, I'm in probably the best place in mental health of my life. I, mm-hmm. uh, because, I, you know, uh, I, ha- I have my family, which just brings me so much joy. I have stability, as I mentioned. So mentally, I'm in such a good place. I don't have anxiety. I used to have a lot of panic attacks. I haven't had a panic attack for, can't even think, um, wow. it's, it's that, that long ago. So, so even though, you know, you have all these challenges and all this difficulty, uh, I'm in the best mental place I've ever been. And I think that speaks quite a lot, actually, to the circumstances mattering, foundations mattering, community mattering, relationships mattering to our mental health way more than what's going on. Because trust me, if it was five years ago and I was getting this much sleep, I'd be a mess uh, uh, mentally. Yeah. Absolutely. But because I have that stability, uh, I'm in a really good place. So, 
yeah, my my mind is good. I'm thinking very clearly, and uh, and I think that's down to all sorts of things. But uh, certainly, being able to let go of perfectionism is one of. Well, let me ask then specifically on panic attacks. I mean, we are at an all time high. It feels like of awareness of uh, you know of anxiety and, and I think levels of anxiety. And so when you look at perfectionism and that striving to be perfect, that striving to please people, to meet expectations and the shoulds, like you talked about, can, is it, is it fair? I mean, is that, is your own work on your own personal aspects of perfectionism? What has helped you get out of panic attacks? Yeah. I mean, you know, I would just any listener who's suffering with these things, it's really, really important to recognize that, um, the first thing to do is seek help. Um, it's so so important because once you're into a state of panic there is a, a there's an overactivity that's going on that's uh that means that the anxiety is essentially taking over and uh creating physiological responses palpitations uh difficulty throat tightening uh listlessness fatigue all of these symptoms that are kind of uh, are common in people with uh generalized panic um it's really important to reach out, seek out, which is what I did. And I was able to embark on a journey of kind of acceptance and recognizing that perfectionism was having a huge, huge impact on my life, way beyond anything that um, I I believe. Because I thought perfectionism was hard, like, the one thing I had left <laughs> like, that was carrying me forward. I didn't realize it was a thing that was underneath all of the anxiety. So that epiphany was very important. Um, and then after that, you know, again, it's, it's just, it's basic stuff, but just working on yourself, you know, um, t- choosing a different path, uh, making sure you look after yourself, good exercise, good diet, uh, trying to find stability where you can find it. It's not easy these days, but, but making sure you, you reconnect with friends, you, uh, uh spend time with your family. If you're lucky enough to have family. Um, all of these things that we know are really, really important for our mental health and you can start to build your life back um, and and away from uh, the panic that, that can really take over. So that's certainly my journey. Um, but it was perfectionism. Perfectionism was at the root of it, you know. It didn't let me... I had I had I had a bad... I had a, quite a bad breakup around that time, but it didn't let me rest, recuperate, heal. It just kept me pushing forward. It kept me pushing through it kept me trying to strive and strive and strive and that's what created a lot of the anxiety and worry which ended up in the panic so you know perfectionism is a very extreme end can lead to some really difficult mental health outcomes um and it's so so important you recognize that preemptively and and uh talk to someone because that's where you can really start which is why this book is so timely for where our culture is because we're seeing the suffering on the other side of that to such a great degree. I'm grateful that you put this out. So tell me about money, uh, finances, wealth, what's driving you there in your life with your relatively young family? Oh, goodness me. Finances. I'm not very good with finances. Um, buy low, sell high. Is that how you do it? I'm not sure. <laughs> Something like that. That's what they say. <laughs> I've heard that. Uh- <laughs> Not my, um, not my area of expertise. That's what you hired me before. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, I mean, again, look, it's it's. I've never had money, so it's always been one of those things where I've um, I've just been grateful to have. It's actually been one of the areas of my life where I haven't had too many worries at all. I think that's mm-hmm. one of the blessings of of coming from a more modest means. Never had money. So if I have, if I, if I have it, it's, it's, I'm just absolutely over the moon. <laughs> so yeah, I think my relationship with money is quite healthy, healthy in that respect. Um, I don't cling to it. Uh, I feel like I'm quite generous and I try to make sure that I look after people that I love uh, if I can. So that includes my family, uh, particularly with the cost of living crisis. So uh, money is just really not, it's, it's, it's just a means to having a, a a good enough life right if we're going to bring it back to that and that's that's simply how i look at it all right the next category i've been eager to get to as its achievements and you know you talked about success being a dead end under perfectionism because it's always underwhelming anticlimactic like you talked about with your own 
you know, PhD. So as you have worked out of or are working out of your own perfectionism, how has that altered what drives you in regards to looking at achievements going towards those? Yeah, uh, no, it's a really good, it's a really good question. Again, you know, it's good to have, it's good to have goals first and foremost, and it's good to have lofty goals as well. You know, if we want to do well, we want to achieve, and I've certainly got um, goals to be a professor, um, to uh, to have, you know, high impact publications, um, to try to lead the way in, in, in the field that I'm working in, which I feel at some level I've already achieved that. So um, those are kind of the goals that drive me. But I do try to make sure that I'm flexible about those goals as well. And I know that, you know, I might not make professor until I'm 40 or maybe 45 and that's okay. There's no hard and fast. I have to be done by this time and it has to be um, done this way. I'm, I'm trying to remain philosophical and in, as I mentioned, enjoy the ride, uh, enjoy the, the interaction with the students. That's really important to me. Um, enjoy the time writing the papers and discussing with scholars and talking to people like yourself who um, uh, want to know more about the topic area. All of these things, just, I'm really just trying to throw myself into <laughs> and enjoy the moment and, and enjoy the process of disseminating or communicating the knowledge. So, you know, whether I can wrap it, wrap up, a, a, you know, that into a, you know, this is a definitive achievement that I want to have by X, Y, and Z is really difficult, but I think, don't think, at the same time, I don't think necessarily that's that's the point. I think, as, as we talked about it at length, the, the main point is that, you know, I'm doing something with purpose and I feel like it's my vocation. And I think that's the most important. I, I appreciate you coming back again to Sam being flexible. You know, we talked about that with food and, and, and you talked, it might've been in our first talk together about, you know, be, not being rigid or maybe it was this talk as well earlier, but not being rigid. That seems like such a big foundation of perfectionism or of escaping the perfection trap is being <laughs> flexible, not so rigid with ourselves. And even this amongst achievements that holding them, holding them lightly, would you say? Yeah. It's like, I suppose for anyone that's sailed, I think sailing is a good analogy because you know, as a, you can be the best sailor in the world, but conditions are going to dictate how fast you go. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. and how hard it's gonna be yeah. um yeah. and that's the same with life you know you, uh, you can be the best academic you want but conditions are going to dictate if you get your professorship in five or ten years because you don't know what's around the corner you don't know if there's going to be a health scare you don't know if yeah yeah you know you're going to start a family you don't know these things you you just don't know that's the great thing about life in some ways we see it as a challenge but actually it's a beautiful thing about life that it is imperfect and it's a jagged path and there's going to be times where life's going to get in the way and and we have to be we have to be like a sailor i suppose know that we've got a destination we know we want to go but also recognize that along the way conditions are going to dictate how far is it going to get there and how hard it's going to be and, and accepting that from the get-go yeah. provides that psychological flexibility as we talked about to meet those challenges head on not get dispirited not get put off and keep forging a path forward and that's the most important thing progress over perfection yeah goodness well the last category here is just interest what? just personal interest this is again just some of the behind the scenes on you what are the things that you do that may be play may be fun may be you know not not productive in and of itself and i know that from uh you know you appreciate the exercise of cycling but it sounds like that's something that you do you talked about that it's meditative and you just enjoy that yeah. uh tell me about that and are there any other interests that you have that just inspires you absolutely well i'm of an age now where uh, it's too late for me to be a professional <laughs> <laughs> fair, fair. so this is this is another real uh it, this is a uh uh, a liberating moment too so you i can do these things for meditation and cycling Cy cycling let me tell you for anyone listening uh, and i'm sure kevin will agree <laughs> is uh the most meditative thing you can do maybe running as well maybe but once you're out on the open road you've got a nice clean tarmac there's nothing on the road it's just beautiful fresh air and countryside ah it's just perfect that's perfection that's what perfection is and you just sit on the saddle and you spin through the revolutions no computer no nothing just 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 meditating 
just just in in that moment there's not there's no better feeling and i'm getting a lot of those same feelings when i spend time with my son um those meditative moments those just spontaneous moments of joy where he just smiles at you or comes and gives you a cuddle and then nothing else matters like in those moments so i don't know whether that's a hobby but that's something i love to do every evening um I play music. Well, music's been a big part of my life. I really suck at singing and I suck at guitar as well. But again, you know, don't let perfectionism hold you back at the things you suck at. <laughs> do do it anyway, you know, if it brings you joy. And that's certainly something that brings me joy. So um, those are the things in my life where I, I can look and I can smile. And I know that they're the things that really bring enriching, you know, just bring so much richness to my life. And, and the more you do them, the greater regularity, the experience, that joy, the happier your life is. So, Fill your life with those moments. They're so precious. It, it, you remind me of, uh, especially with cycling, the idea of being in flow. That's what oh, I yeah. find in yeah. that state is just I'm in flow. And so, man, I feel you totally on that. And it, it's interesting with your, you know, even the time with your son, it brings me back to a word that you used earlier of savoring that outside, on the outside of perfectionism, giving that up, getting out of the, as your book says, the perfection trap is the opportunity to be present, uh, be grateful and to savor uh, the moment, oh, yeah. which is not diluted by perfectionism. Yeah, absolutely. Like the, the, the pressure, you know, perfectionism is the fee for joy. Mm. And I think the goal of life is to really, you're never going to live in a, in a, in a complete state of ecstasy, <laughs> of joy. But I think the goal in life is to taste those moments of spontaneous joy with ever great regularity. That should be the goal. And the more you throw yourself into situations in your life where you really have those moments, savor them. You know, this life is short. Savor every each and every one of them and give yourself the permission to do more and more of them. Even if that you know, even if you think they get in the way of other things that you think are more important, like your work or the bottom line or money or whatever. It's so important that your life is filled with joy. And yes, it is important that you earn a living and all the rest of it. I get that. But it's also important you, that you give yourself permission to have those moments because that's what life is all about at the end of the day. So um, so don't let perfectionism take over. It will, fe- it will steal that joy. Don't let it. It's so important you experience it. Well, no better way to end this than on that. And folks, I would say it was shameless promotion. Uh, why don't you get the book and savor that book as you find freedom? I think that that's, I found, I found a lot of comfort, honestly, and, and just kind of, uh, yeah, like I did earlier, it's like a, oh, thank you. Thank you for giving me permission to let that go and just enjoy uh, the good enough in essence and not ruin it with perfection. So again, folks, the book is The Perfection Trap, Embracing the Power of Good Enough. And you can connect with Thomas at thomascurran.com. It's uh, Thomas and then C-U-R-R-A-N.com and uh, get a hold of everything else that he's doing. And if you got value from this, let us know. Okay. Give us a, a rating and review. And on mm-hmm. Apple, you can give mm-hmm. us a review and, and mm-hmm. tell us what you got out of this show. Tell Thomas what you got. It'll bless us both. You can watch this if you would like. You can see him in the dark over in England uh, while I'm still in the light here in Colorado at uh, YouTube or on uh, any of the social media. We'll have a bunch of clips up there and find me at at kevinmiller.co. And if you want to learn how to master your own inner drive, you can check out my book as well on Amazon, What Drives You. And until next time, stay driven. Yeah.